This year, the BBC is working with museums across Britain to tell a history of the world. So for Inside Out, I've been learning how the ingenuity of people right here in the North West helped Britain to rule the waves and to win the Second World War. If you had to pick one thing which has shaped the history of our nation and our relation to the rest of the world, then it's this. C. For thousands of years, if someone wanted to invade or trade with us, then this is how they got here. And if we fancied a spot of invading or global trading, that's how we went. The empire was built on seafaring. And seafaring was built on an unrivaled understanding of the ways of the ocean. The preeminent port of empire was Liverpool, and around Merseyside, extraordinary research was done, which changed the relationship with the sea, not just here, but across the globe. Now, we're actually heading out to sea, and if you don't think this is the appropriate vehicle to do it in, well, in an hour or so's time, you'd be absolutely right, because getting out there is dependent on the tides, which is fitting, because measurement of the tides at our destination changed the world. Dave, how long will it take us to get out? Well, it's going to take us about 10 minutes. Um, but it's, it's easy for us because we're in the vehicle and, and most people aren't authorised to drive across. Dave Kavanagh is ranger of Hilbury Island, two miles offshore from Wirral. I presume it can be quite a dangerous place to get across to. It can be. Before you come out, you've got to make sure you understand the tide times. There is information uh, on the web and on notice boards. Get it wrong and you could be stranded for five hours. It's a good old yomp across, isn't it? Tide measurement has been carried out here since Victorian times. The measuring device is kept in the half-derelict former lifeboat station. OK, the Dave, here we are. Let's have a look behind the green door and padlock it. A bit of a shove. Right, in we go. So, how does this work, Dave? Um, as the tide goes in and out, the water underneath here goes up and down and there's a float, which I have an example of here, uh, which is attached to the wire that you can see underneath here, um, which is attached to a pen through some gears, which then goes up and down on this graph paper. Isn't it incredible to think that the information from this little room has been interpreted by people and then it's increased people's knowledge of how tides work across the world? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Hilbury was one of several measuring stations around Liverpool. The numbers were crunched at another semi-abandoned location inland. It's Bidston Observatory in Wirral, which as you can see is looking a little bit sorry for itself now. But some fairly amazing research was carried out here and a man who knows more about that than most is Professor Phil Woodworth who used to work here. Phil, this started life as an astronomical observatory, didn't it? That's right, it was built in the, uh, the 1860s by the Mersey Docks and Harbour Board. And in 1919, it became a tidal uh, laboratory of the University of Liverpool. The tides are uh, controlled by the moon and the sun, so there's a natural link there with astronomy. And you can see uh, one of the, the white domes up there, which contained one of the, one of the telescopes, which uh, was used for astronomy re research. The scientists are long gone. A few people live here now as caretakers. It certainly smells damp enough, doesn't it? Needs a bit of heating, I suppose. Amazing work did take place in these rooms. Yeah, the Tidal Observatory uh, became the, the best uh, place in the world for, for knowing about the tides, and now we know the tide just, just about anywhere in the world to about two centimetres. Tell me about the amazing piece of kit that used to be here. Well, it was a wonderful piece of equipment with uh, wheels and pulleys and flashing lights and so on. And it was uh, really a form of uh, computer before the days of uh, uh, modern electronic computers that we have now. Well, there's still some stuff left in the room, Phil. I mean, what? What on earth is this? Look at this. Old tables, old charts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they, they, these, are, these are bits of uh, um, documentation to do with making tide tables. And um, you can see perhaps at the back there's a, uh, a curve there which shows uh, sea level rising in Eschberg in, in Denmark. There's more box files over here as well, Phil. Let's have a look at this one. Ah, astronomical data from the 1960s. Yeah, well, it's very important to know the um, pos positions of the moon and sun uh, so you can predict the tide accurately. I'm just lying around here, gathering dust. 
It's a shame, isn't it? Some objects from Bidston have been rescued. You can see them at the World Museum in Liverpool. And you can see an immediate forerunner to the computer at the Science Museum in London. But the Bidston computer itself? Well, it's been rescued up to a point. Wow, what a place. Oh, yes, it's uh, one of the stores and it's actually full. It's tucked out of public view at the Museum of Liverpool stores under the care of curator Alan Bowden. It's in pieces, a sorry fate for a world-changing machine based on work by a son of Darwin. Ah, here it is. Is this the original Bidston computer? Well, what's left of it, I suppose. That's right. This is the Robert's Leg tie predictor, built in 1908. If you were to get it working again, you'd need to have a tape which would actually run round here and then round these pulley wheels. Could you get it working again? It would be possible to get it working again if we could actually get a, another tape made. When it was up and running, you could enter six months' worth of tidal data from any location on the planet. And bingo, you get the tides for any date in the future. You could actually produce tidal charts for, you know, any port around the world or even places that were not ports. And, and presumably that gives us an indication of just why we were regarded as such a maritime power. That's right, it was a, a tool of immense utility. And where was the impact of all that maritime expertise felt most keenly? Well, try asking the Germans. I'll show you in the forward section of the U-boat here so you can see actually the guts of the machine. The Neil Scales is a man passionate about U-boats. He brought one to Woodside uh, Ferry Terminal in Wirral to create the U-Boat Museum. There you have it there, and that hatch is where the, the batteries would have been. U-534 was sunk in 1945 off Denmark and salvaged in 1993. The Danes didn't want her. She was brought to Merseyside and sliced open to expose an interior which survived 48 years underwater. These were pretty fearsome war machines, weren't they, Neil? Yeah, they were state-of-the-art at the time. They would, would do a, a range of about 11,000 miles. Very difficult to defeat in battle. What they lacked was a sophisticated knowledge of the tides. So where did they get that from? They actually bought it from us, and uh, here's one of the Admiralty books here, which they bought in 1938. So they bought British expertise before the war? Absolutely. Well, they knew the war was coming, so what they did was they've got as much information on tidal floors and, uh, and charts as they could. Across the water, Liverpool, home base for saviour of the wartime Atlantic convoys, Captain Johnny Walker. His knowledge of the sea helped him destroy more U-boats than anyone else. If the Germans had had a bit more understanding of how tide tables work, maybe the war would have turned out slightly different. Sobering to think how a squiggle on a piece of graph paper at Hilbury Island could have helped to scupper a state-of-the-art fighting machine like this. It's been fascinating to see how the North West had such an impact globally, but so sad to see just how much of our history simply moulders away and is forgotten. And isn't it an irony that out of all the things we've seen, it's this, the intended victim of all that number crunching, which has survived the best. If you have an object which tells what the people and places of the UK have given the world, then you can add it to our digital museum so you can help us tell a history of the world. For more details, go to bbc.co.uk slash a history of the world. Well, that's it for this week. Don't forget you can watch again on the BBC iPlayer. I'm going to find a nice pub to thaw out in. I'll see you next Monday. Bye-bye. <laughs>